God is good, amen? I can't hear. Say, God is good. And all the time, amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you look good. Come on, say it with confidence. You look good. Okay, we're going to get straight into the message, um, straight into tonight's message. It's going to be a short message, but I believe out of every message that we hear, we can get something out of it and it can change our life if we choose to. God has, God is speaking something all the time, but it is us. If we are listening, we it can change our lives because God's word, it says that it never comes back void. So if we pay attention to God, if we open up our hearts tonight, God can speak a word into your life that can change a part of your life or your whole life if you give it a chance. Amen, church? How many of you guys are going to open your hearts today to God's word? Amen? Amen. Uh, let's open up our Bibles. If you have your Bible, open to Judges 6 verse 11. Judges 6 verse 11 and we have uh, the words on the screen so you can uh, just pay attention and follow with me. It says, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terabith tree which was in Ophrah which belonged to Joash the Abiz Abizrite while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Benedites. And verse 12 and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And the message title for tonight will be Mighty Man of Valor. So if you have your notes with you, you can write that down. Um, we live in a generation which suffers with this disease called identity crisis. Many people do not know who they are what they can do, what God said about them. So they begin to go from one point to another one, searching into who they are. They follow crowds, they follow opinions, they begin to make choices um, depending on greed, depending on fear, depending on desperation, depending on loneliness. And every single person around us is looking for the worth, looking who they are. For example, myself, back in the day, <laughs> I almost became a rapper, like it or not. I almost did. <laughs> that was this picture. I'll, I'll go back through some of our pictures back in the day. I, like, I had this beanie, I had this wife beater, and these huge headphones on the, going to camp on this rock, throwing gang signs. I'm like, looking back, I'm like, Jesus, thank you for pastors and mentors. I didn't know who I was, and I was searching for that. <laughs> almost five years ago, I, I, true story, I almost got married it's no immense that so it, it's because we look we we look for who we are in people we look for opinions we look into our friends to tell us who we are we look at what the crowd is doing we're following because we do not know who we are in Christ Jesus many choices are made because of fear because of loneliness because of desperation because we are lacking to know and to see what God says about us and here we read in the scripture Gideon he's he is just basically uh, somebody who's threshing wheat and the angel of the Lord come to him and says the Lord is with you he says you mighty man of valor before Gideon does anything before uh, Gideon wins a war before Gideon conquers or has his achievement for defeating an enemy God begins to tell him that you are a mighty man of valor we have to understand before we can accomplish anything in life, before we can do anything, we have to understand our worth. Who we are in God, what God says that we have and what God says that we can do. God comes to Gideon before he does anything, before he asks, hey, what are you doing with this wheat? Why are you hiding for people? God tells him, you are a mighty man of valor. You are not your position. You are not condition or an opinion of others. We have to understand that. We have a generation that is running behind people's position. They think they are what they have accomplished. We see many people who, who get a degree and they begin to walk with their shoulders squared up and saying, well, I am because of what I achieved. 
Many people begin to think because many are saying, oh, you're good, you're a good soccer player, you're a good speaker, you're a good listener. So they begin to label them as somebody great. So they live their life thinking that there's something that the people, an opinion of people, opinion of others. People begin to label themselves because they make six digits income. That's why they begin to feel great. People base their identity upon their position, upon their condition and opinion of others. And this is what gets many people into trouble and then many people that I come in contact with, that I talk with, they made so many mistakes because of this same issue. That they base their identity on what they have and how they feel and what people say about them. And one thing that we have to understand from this scripture is that God says that you are a mighty man of valor before you can do anything. We have to understand and realize our worth before we can do anything for God. Before we have these, these amazing dreams for God, before we want to become a doctor, before we want to become a basketball player or just a family man, we have to understand who we are in God. We have to understand and find out what does God say about me? Who am I? Am I what people say or am I what God says about me? Am I who God says that I am? What I can do and what I have? Or am I the opinion of others? You have to find out who you are in Christ Jesus. And we know God's word says that we are more than conquerors. We know God's word says that we are sons and daughters of the most high God. We know that God's word says that we are kings and queens destined to reign that we're a chosen generation we're a peculiar people that we're not our mistake we're not our issue we're not our past and we're not the opinion of others amen church amen. who are you in Christ Jesus if you do not know it'll be easy for somebody to give you that label if you do not know who you are in Christ Jesus you can easily be swayed by opinion of others the saying you should choose this you should do this you should marry this person you should choose this career and the opinion of others will begin to sway you the pressure of other the pressure of your peers the pressure of this society will begin to to make a toll saying you need to get this kind of car or you need to dress like this or you need to do this because you do not know who you are in Jesus Christ I uh, remember um, back in the day I used to do, I used to trade stocks and, um, <laughs> Nazar, you feel me, bro? <laughs> so uh, back in the day I used to do financial things and um, I remember one day I was just like racking up some serious money. I am thinking it was like one day we made like $20,000. I'm just like for real, for real. Like I can't even show you the bank statements, you know, I'm not lying. And then I was just like, bam, dude, I'm like, get out of the house. I get in the car with style. I just slowly drive through the dealers I'm like yeah that one <laughs> I even go test this BMW car I get in the car and then he's like you know how I drive I'm like hey put it the first gear start peeling out like Wah! you know I'm like tomorrow you know I'll come pick up the car <laughs> the next day I find out that the the bank account gets closed that we were dealing with this Ukrainian bankers and the, that's when the market collapsed and all the banks closed and we lost twenty thousand dollars then from then on I got back humbly with my Nissan Sentra. I'm like, oh, I like this car. <laughs> and it's, it was so easy for me because I did not know who I was in Christ Jesus. That position, that, the things that I acquired made me feel like I'm this, this guy who like is on top of the world. Whereas I'm basing my identity on things that can easily disappear. This generation, they, they begin to mark themselves and they begin to attach their identity to material things that can easily disappear. I remember one of my friends, we were talking uh, when it was back, when we were doing this whole financial thing. And then, um, you know, when this whole collapse thing happened, you know, we, I got out. It was a couple of like a few weeks of depression. You know, we got back on our feet. But I remember one guy that I was listening to and he was in the same thing that we were doing. The next morning, what we heard a news from, from all his friends is that he lost everything. He had like, I think it was like $500,000 and, and that day, like he lost everything. And that week, we heard from his family that he just stood in front of the train and just killed himself. People in this world that attach their identity to material things that can easily disappear. Relationships, degrees, health. 
They begin to attach to what they acquire instead of what God says about them. So they begin to make mistakes. They begin to influence their life and they begin to derail from the purpose that God has created them. Amen. We are who God says that we are. We can do what God says that we can do and we have what God says that we have. Amen church. Come on put your hands together for Jesus Christ. We have to understand that tomorrow is a mystery and that we cannot base our identity on things that can easily disappear. Today we have it, tomorrow we don't. Tomorrow is mystery. Just like in Job's life, we can clearly see that if Job has tied his identity to the possession that he had, one day would have wiped his name out of the face of the earth. The one day came just like that. But we know that he said and he knew that tomorrow is a mystery. The God only is the one that knows tomorrow. But he put his trust in God. It says, blessed be thy name in good times and in bad times alike. We as the people of God, we need to first of all know our identity in Christ Jesus, who we are in God and not attach our identity to things that can easily disappear. Amen, church? We see another thing that we read in verse 11 that getting threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Gideon was basically hiding. He was hiding from the enemy just living a life of survival mode. Living a life where he can just just do the bare minimum and we know that this is not the life that Jesus Christ died for. If God wanted you to have a life of survival he will never have to live a brutal death. He didn't have to go on the cross and die the type of death that he did. Many people say, well, I do not want to be radical. I don't, you know, these whole dreams, the whole vision that you guys have to pursue to be somebody great in life. I just want to chill. I just want to relax. Little do they know that this whole chill period is never chilled. That they're going to become radical in one way or the other. You cannot stay in the middle. You can't have gray. You either have white or black. You either be passionate for God and go all out for God. Or you're going to be very passionate in depression. You're going to be very passionate into drugs. You're going to be very passionate into party life. In things that can destroy you. But you cannot live a life that is just chill. You cannot. There is no neutral ground. You cannot sit on the fence in this life. You might sit on the fence for one day. But it will never last more than a week. You either will go all the way for God. Or sooner or later, you're going to go all the way for depression, for sickness, for anxiety, for fear, for those things that will destroy your life. And we see in the scripture, Gideon was just hiding a lie. He was just, was just wanting to survive, was wanting to live a life that is just normal. But God comes to him and he says, you are a mighty man of valor. Before he did anything, he had to realize that I am more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who give me strength. I am a chosen generation. I am a destined queen for God's glory. Can somebody put your hands together for Jesus Christ? I am not my appearance. I am not my mistake. I am not my past. I am not what my parents labeled me as. I am not what other people think of me. I am. I am what God says I am and that changes not because God's word says that heaven and earth will pass away but my words will always remain the same. That means if God says that you are an apple of his eye, that you are his beloved, that you are his child, that means that does not change. You have to see yourself the way God sees you in order for you to accomplish the things that God has for you in life. God has placed a dream, a vision, a something beautiful in each one of us. But in order for us to access that, we have to see ourselves the way God sees us. Amen, church? Another thing that we cannot expect a lot from people and expect a little bit from God. It has to be a different way around. We have to expect a lot from God and little from people. We have to expect and get our strength and our energy, everything from God than from people because we know one thing is sure and certain with people is that they have the tendency to disappoint. They have the tendency to disappoint. Don't expect a lot from people, from your family, maybe from your friends. Maybe you're looking for that acceptance from people. Accept, expect it from God. 
Maybe you're looking for that acceptance from your work or, or your degree or, or everything that you're looking for. Look for that acceptance in Christ Jesus because he is our hope. He is our strength and he's our joy in Jesus' name. Amen, church? Another thing that we see we can get from this scripture is God comes to Gideon and he says in verses, uh, did we read verse 14? No, we did not read verse 14. Let's read for verse 14 real fast. Judges 6 verse 14 is just, it goes uh, later on. It says that, um, then the Lord turned to him and says, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat Midianites as one man. After God comes to Gideon, he says that you are a mighty man of valor. The second thing that he says, he says, go and rescue my people. Go and fight for the people of Israel. After we find out our identity in Christ Jesus, we need to realize another thing is that God wants us to be fighting for his people. Many people think that, you know, it's like we're talking about our, our lifestyle has to be only winning people. We can't work. We can't have a job. We can't do anything that we like. We just have to be bringing people to church and that's all we have to do. No, there's a difference between a purpose and a calling. Uh, there's a difference between a career and a calling. Career is something that you choose in school, something that you like to do. For example, if it's, you know, being a technician or is it being a car mechanic, or is it being an engineer, or is it be a soccer player, or is it be just a, a driver or whatever it is going to be. That is your career. That's something that you love to do, something that you get money for, and something that will not hurt people. That is your career. But your calling is chosen for you. It's chosen when Jesus Christ has died in the cross and you accepted him into your life and you say, God, I belong to you. That is your calling is to fight for God's people. So career, it's something that you can change anytime. You can start off being a rapper like me and ended up being, I don't know what I am now, but I'll let you guys know. Or you can, you know, become a, a just a family man or somebody that just loves to do bare minimum. That is your career and that's something that you can change anytime. But your calling can never change. Your calling is one thing and that's the instruction, the instruction that Jesus Christ has given to us. He says, go into the all world, win souls and make disciples. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to do everything that I've told you. That is your calling. That's something that can ever change. That's something that we're obligated to do as a Christians. And God comes to Gideon. He says, go and fight for my people. We as people, we need to understand that many things, many dreams, many, many talents will be unlocked when we begin to reach out for God's people. I talked about a message one time is that how David reached the throne, how David became a king was his first desire was to fight for God's people. He did not even have in mind, I'm, I'm going to go and fight for these people and I'm going to become a king. No, David said first that I want to rescue God's people and the rescuing God's people has led him to his throne. Same thing with our, with our lives. Many of us, we have amazing dreams that God has placed inside of us. Our calling has to usher us into our dream. Winning people, fighting for God's people, rescuing God's people has to usher us to become what we want to be, to be in our career. You can be a doctor. Still, you can have a, a, a place and a time where you can fight for God's people. You can be just a housewife or you can be an engineer. You can be a soccer player. But in that career that you have chosen, you are still obligated to do what God has called you to do. Is to fight for God's people. We have to do what matters to God the most. We have to make what matters the most matter to us. 
is rescuing God's people is saying that God I will fight for them we are called for one purpose only is to see souls being changed to see people get out of their addictions to see people who are bounded by drugs being set free to see people who are on, under the the curse of sickness seeing them being healed seeing lives being changed that is our calling and that is what God wants us to do doesn't despite our career so I remember there was a time in our church where we, we literally didn't know the difference between career and a calling. We did not know. I remember Sergey, poor guy. <laughs> I was like counseling him. I don't know what I was doing to him. <laughs> we were talking. I was like, I remember he was like, man, I don't know what God wants me to do for you. I'm like, let's fast, bro. <laughs> we like fast for like seven days. I think he did. I just did like two or one. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, bro. <laughs> we were just plagued with this thing is what does God wants us to do? like it's for sure has to be something with holding the mic preaching being a worship team or flip we had these uh like paper slides for worship you know how you guys have so you would like put in this projector and that would beat up on the screen so that was one of the callings <laughs> and we were like we have to do something in church this is our life you know we did not know the difference between career and a calling and tonight we have to let you know that career is something that you love doing something does not that does not hurt people something that you get money for but your calling can never change because that's what God has chosen when he went on the cross is to see people's lives being changed for the glory of God amen church and one thing that we see in uh, verse 15 that Gideon tells to God before before God's like okay you go do this Gideon's like hey uh, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Before Gideon's like, he's not even thinking about uh, about rescuing God's people. He's like, hey, my family is like weak. I don't, I'm weak. I don't know. I'm the weakest. I don't know what to do. I don't know why you've even chosen me to do these things. And I was thinking about that. It's like sometimes God is is he works in such a mysterious ways if you look throughout the bible god always chose people because of the weakness if you see anybody that god comes to moses and he's like moses can't even speak he says you're going to lead a, a a nation out of out of the strongest empire in the world is and moses like I, I, you know he can't even speak right i mean if you really think about it, logically if you think about it it did not make sense god comes to anoint david to be king and, and David is not even in the house where the, where, where the, the thing is going, supposed to happen. David is not even considered as a son of Jesse before he gets anointed. David is just a young, young boy who just spends time with sheep and, and God says that you will be the king. We see Paul and Peter. You see their lives, how their weaknesses were so big. Who Paul was a murderer and God says to him that I'll, I'll, you'll be the one to, who, who have the foundation of the church. Peter, you're the rock. And Peter's just like... I'm far from rock. I don't even know what you're talking about, rock. I, I can't even make up my mind. And God begins to choose people, not because of their strength, but because of the weakness. Begins to say, because God knows that if we rely upon God's strength, our weakness becomes perfect in his strength. Our, sh our weakness begins to turn to strength. Our fear begins to turn into strong faith. When we rely upon God, God begins to take us from somebody that is so weak into becoming a man of valor, just like we read in the Bible. We cannot be able to identify our lives according to our weaknesses, according to what we've done or the mistakes or the things that we left undone because God says, my strength will become perfect in your weakness. My courage will become perfect in your cowardice because all your strength, all your might will come from me and I do not change. I am the beginning and I am the end. I am the Alpha and I am the Omega and I do not change. We cannot look at our lives according to our weakness but know that our weakness can be turned to strength if we give it a chance for God. Amen church? Amen. I mean if you look at this story it's, it's ridiculous because the task that God had, I mean thank God like God is like okay you're gonna deliver this, you're gonna go against an army with 300 people against like this vast, I mean probably Gideon would have lost his mind and continue threshing the wheat or whatever he was doing. You know if God just begins to tell him that hey this is you, you're a mighty man and and he's like I, I'm weak I don't know if I can do it and 
God's like, no, my strength will become with you. You you walk with me. I'll give you directions and you will conquer this city. We've seen in this this Bible was is the less, the more, the more weak we are, the more strength God can give us. The more perfect we are, the less available and the less surrendered we are to God. We read in the scripture and we see a young ruler who's like, Jesus, he comes to Jesus and he says, God, I've did everything. I'm like, you know, you pick your disciples who are fishermen who don't even know what to do, who don't even know the law. They're just like, stink like fish and they, they don't know what to do with these nets and they, they can't catch a fish. You know, I fulfilled all righteousness. I did all this law. I know how to love God. I know how to love my neighbor. But Jesus says, give up everything and follow me. Seemed like he was a perfect candidate for God's ministry, for to become the, the 12 disciples, to become this, this rock who God's going to build this church, but yet he could not surrender his life to Jesus. The more perfect we are, the less surrendered we become to God's will. The more strong that we think that, oh, I have these things I'm going to use for God, the less surrendered that we'll become to God's will. We see that our, our weakness begins to turn to strength if we give our lives to Jesus Christ. God is not looking for perfect. God is not looking for strong, but God is looking for availability. God is looking who is available to go and to do what I have called you to do. This is my people are being suffered. My people are being destroyed under the hand of Midianites. They're being struck down in drugs. That generation is being swiped by, by, by media, by all these things, by sickness, by witchcraft, by idolatry, by all these things. And God is looking not for perfection. God says, who is willing to go? Who is willing to answer my call? Who is willing to stand in the gap and fight for my people? We cannot look, we cannot look at what we cannot do. We cannot look that we cannot speak or we cannot do this or do that. We just have to look that God says, my strength will become perfect in your weakness, you mighty man of valor. Looking back when we, when we first begin, be started this church, when we first, when our pastor had a vision to, to be able to see thousands saved, to see people being healed, being delivered. I mean, if you looked at our group, it's just, it's pitiful. I mean... You see a, a grown man, 35, a pastor, just looking at a bunch of teenagers saying, you're going to win the city for Jesus. And we're like, guys, we're going to rob Goodwill next week. <laughs> Literally, that was our minds. We're like, man, there's a Schwinn bike came out, you know, and it's our Goodwill right now. <laughs> I robbed that store. <laughs> I mean, that was going through our mind. If you logically if you look at that I mean I thank God for pastors uh, for I mean, come on give it up for our pastor that's uh, <laughs> who didn't give up on us and I mean seriously just looking at our lives it's just when we were at that point on the beginning and that's I can relate it to the the story of Gideon I, from, from, from the story of Gideon because that's what God saw I mean, he saw a guy who's hiding from people, a guy who's weak, who comes out of a weak family, weak clan, and God sees in him and he says, you are a mighty man of valor. God says, I, my strength become perfect in your weakness. You can rescue generation. You will see people being saved. You will see people being healed, being delivered. You will see Toyota Center being filled for the glory of God will be packed with services. You see that this place will be too small. You will see people being healed from incurable diseases. These things will happen to you, but you have to realize that your weakness is not a hindrance to God because he says that my strength will become perfect in your weakness. Amen, church? How many of you guys are going to answer the call that God has for us? And next week we have is coming up a miracle catch. This is a perfect way, a perfect opportunity for us to be able to answer the call and to be able to fight for God, for what God has, has, has given us as a, as a call. I've seen people saved. I see this generation being rescued from the hand of the enemy. To see generation being rescued from the grip of drugs, of sickness, of immorality, all these things. Uh, how can we answer the call that God has for us? Is inviting people. Reaching out to people. How Louise has shared a wonderful word. There's, there's no better way to be able to describe it and to tell you how you can reach out to a lost generation. There's no better way. Uh, last week I had a chance to be able to go visit a guy in the hospital who's just who's suffering from drugs, from, from just so many bad choices. And you see his life and it's just, Satan has just destroyed it completely. 
you know and I had opportunity just an hour just to share with him what you know what kind of plans that God has for him you know it just I'm like hey man God loves you God wants to see you delivered from these drugs from all these things Satan's just destroying your life you know God can help you and to see in this is his eyes and he's like man I, I, I hate this life he's like I wanted to take my life I want to commit suicide I just I hate this life somebody help me how many people are like that in Tri-Cities? How many people are that like that in your, cir in your circle of friends? On, on Facebook, on Instagram, in your college place where you work out at? So many people are just surrounded and they're just brought down by this, by this meeting that's by Satan who has captured them and he's holding them down. And many people are in this place can testify that they were once in that position but somebody said, God, I will go. I will fight for your people. And that's why your result and you're sitting here today but how many people are still waiting for you to go how many people are still waiting for you to step out and say God I know I'm weak I know I'm not perfect I know I have faults I know I messed up I know I have a past but I'm saying yes I'm willing to go I'm willing to fight I'm willing to stand and to see a generation being rescued from the grip of Satan I'm seeing I'm willing to stand in the gap and say that God my generation will be a generation that will seek after your face that will not seek after drugs they will not seek after immorality and pride and greed and all these things but they will seek unto your face God I'm choosing to say yes God I'm choosing to go forward God I'm gonna fight I don't know how I'll do I, I know I'm weak but God I know that you said that I am a mighty man of valor I believe it I believe it. I'm gonna go I'm going to do it God is looking for you to step out and say that. God is looking. We, we have many people. I mean, are we, are we talking on Facebook? How many people are waiting for that encouragement word? Are we talking about when we go to, to, uh, to the gym? Are we talking about when we go to the park or th things like that? People are being destroyed by Satan. And there's somebody is waiting for you to step out and to do what God has called you to do. And the last point I want to talk about is that God said to verse 16, he said to Gideon and the Lord said to him surely I'll be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Third point is our relationship and not our work. We have to understand in order for us to go with God in order for us to be able to to do what God's called them you have to have that relationship with God. We have to have that relationship with the Holy Spirit. You cannot be with one person for such a long time and not to get to know them and when God says I got God says to Gideon I will go with you he meant that look I'm going to guide you I'm going to give you instructions I'm going to give you how you're going to defeat your enemy but you have to be willing to know and to understand and to obey our relationship with the Holy Spirit is not something that we just say that oh I know the Holy Spirit it has to be that the Holy Spirit knows us. Our life does not begin when we get Holy Spirit but when Holy Spirit gets us. Many people can proclaim and profess that you know they know the Holy Spirit but how many people does Holy Spirit know? How many people that when they walk and they speak the Holy Spirit backs up on what they speak? Our relationship with the Holy Spirit has to be the fundamental because we see that victory for Gideon came only when he obeyed the instructions of the Lord. We can only conquer this generation and to be able to see people saved, to see miracles, to see signs and wonders like it says in the Bible when we develop our relationship with the Holy Spirit, when we get to know and when we obey His voice. One, no, first thing first few I want to just give you a few points on how to get to know the Holy Spirit number one is make a decision to stay with the Holy Spirit forever because Holy Spirit has made a decision to never leave you or forsake you number two is make time in your daily schedule for the Holy Spirit this is a wonderful opportunity that we have in our church and I just thank God for a church because I have not heard a church around here that has morning prayers from from as early as even three in the morning where you can come and you can develop that relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
gives you an opportunity. So we want to challenge our vision and our goal is actually to see a 24-hour prayer being offered here at church. The prayer never stops. We're going to see right now, I mean before for us was like when you said 4.30 in the morning, I was like 4.30 in the morning. I'm like, yeah, it's, but now it's like 5 in the morning. It's easy. It became easy. Now we're pushing further because we have a generation that is dying and we know that unless we get to know the Holy Spirit, unless we have Holy Spirit with us, we cannot accomplish and we cannot see the victory that God has for us. Number three is come back when you make a mistake. It's very important that when we make a mistake, which we all will do, that we'll be first ones to run to God before Satan does. When we make a mistake, which we all do, that we'll be the first ones to run to God before the devil does. And number four is obey the Holy Spirit, obey His voice. We see from the life of Gideon that Gideon, he makes a, a history, he makes a change. He transforms a nation of Israel because he chooses to obey the instructions of the Holy Spirit. He rewrites the history of his family. He rewrites the history of his generation. Becomes to accomplish things that it's not even impossible to understand how he accomplished it. But because with Holy Spirit, he obeyed the instructions of the Holy Spirit. He became a man of valor. He became a one who made a difference in his generation and has changed the history of Israel. We tonight, as people of God, as Christians, as believers, when we choose to obey the Holy Spirit, we begin to know the Holy Spirit. We'll be able to see a generation that is saved. We'll be able to see our friends, our family being rescued from affliction, from bondages, from sickness, from drugs. We'll be able to see a generation being saved from the grip of the enemy. We'll be able to see our lives being changed for His glory. But we have to answer the call that God has for us. Saying that God, I will go. And to begin to go and to be able to develop that relationship with the Holy Spirit.